Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the President's Day edition of the Three Martini Lunch. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Who better else to sub for Jim Garrity on President's <laughs> Day than Andrew Johnson of National Review, one of America's most revered presidents. And, Andrew, how are you? Happy President's Day. Yeah, it's not usually uh, – Andrew Johnson is not usually one of the people – uh, they're celebrating on uh, on President's Day, so I'm glad I'm glad you're giving him the recognition he deserves. Outstanding. We're always <laughs> we're always happy to give credit where credit is due. All right, on to the good martini today, and the the good and the bad are uh, very closely related. The third is not at all. Uh, the good martini is that after a very difficult weekend, we saw another world leader taking strong, concrete steps to take out an existential threat. It was a very difficult weekend in terms of. The threat posed by radical Islam. It started in Copenhagen when gunmen entered this cafe where the Swedish cartoonist Lars Vilk was uh, having uh, an event and there was a shooting there. Then the gunman uh, went down the street, actually killed a person outside a synagogue. There were a couple of policemen wounded as well. By the end of the day, the shooter was killed as well. Then in, in Libya, 21 Coptic Christians uh, murdered by ISIS, beheaded. And the only good news we're seeing out of this is the decisive action taken by the new Egyptian president, General al-Sisi, who without any hesitation whatsoever was already launching airstrikes against ISIS targets in neighboring Libya. Kind of reminiscent, Andrew, I think, of uh, King Abdullah saying this is the line in the sand. Uh, We will not be turning back at this point. We're going to take you out. And that's the type of leadership I think a lot of us are uh, hoping to see out of our own president. But at least we're seeing it out of critical players in the region. Yeah, like you said, really the only sort of good news that comes out of this is is global leaders, especially in that region, sort of unifying against the threat. I mean, every, everyone obviously knew uh, the Islamic State was a threat. They knew that its expansion was worrisome. It's sad that these tragedies sort of trigger this, but but at, but at least people are stepping up to the plate and sort of waking up to the situation here. One hopes that we don't need more of these tragedies to get other people, other nations involved, other nations acting to it. But as for now, again, the good news is that there, there's, a, there's a unifying uh, opposition to this and, and that people are recognizing uh, that threat. President Obama spent the weekend out in California. Most of the weekend he spent on the golf course, and it's a holiday weekend. Uh, you don't necessarily want to take that away from him. But his reaction to both of these news events, the, the terrorist attack in Copenhagen and the beheading of Coptic Christians, very minimal in the minds of many people here. And that's our bad martini. Only a couple of written statements, one of which was just a couple of sentences. In response to Copenhagen, the statement was not even from the president or any major person on his national security team. It was by National Security Council spokesperson Bernadette Meehan, and we all, of course, know who she is. Uh, This is the statement in its entirety. The United States condemns today's deplorable shooting in Copenhagen. We offer our condolences to the loved ones of the deceased victim, and our thoughts are with those wounded in this attack. We have been in close contact with our Danish counterparts and stand ready to lend any assistance necessary to the investigation. End of statement. When it came to the murder of the Coptic Christians in Libya, They didn't even call them Coptic Christians. It was just the United States condemns the despicable and cowardly murder of 21 Egyptian citizens in Libya by ISIL-affiliated terrorists. That one's from Josh Ernest. That one actually is a couple of meaty paragraphs long, and they call it barbarity and all sorts of other things. So the language is a little bit stronger in that statement. But nowhere uh, in the Copenhagen statement is there a reference to terrorism. Certainly nothing related to radical Islam. As we know, they're completely anathema to to reference what's actually going on here. So, Andrew, what's the consequence of this? This is sort of reminiscent of uh, what we saw at the prayer breakfast that that I know you guys talked about a lot. Right. Um, Is that it's just this weird sort of denial uh, approach that this administration takes to these sorts of issues. It's kind of hard to put a finger on it, but it's something that we've even seen some Democrats come forward and take issue with this administration, Tulsi Gabbard, Congresswoman from Hawaii, that this administration is being in denial about what's going on here, that they're not acknowledging what the threat is, they're not acknowledging what the enemy is. And it just is worrisome. I mean, again, I, we're not going to knock him too much. This was a pre-planned trip, obviously. He, he, you're not going to take that away from him. But just to go back to it last week, and again, not, not to hit him too much on it, but it's just sort of when we look at an administration that after the Foley beheading said we, ha- we should be more concerned about optics in these dangerous times and how we come off. 
And then last week you have sort of the, the selfie stick incident that, again, it, it, it almost feels cheap to criticize them on. But this is an administration that's admitted its own failure on optics. And then something that's not even optics, something that's statement, something that's official positions on behalf of this White House, not acknowledging terrorism, not acknowledging the faith of the 21 people that happened to be beheaded. I was seeing earlier that one of the targets in this Danish shooting is now in hiding uh, for fear of his life. I mean, there are real life consequences, real world consequences. People are fearful for their lives. And there's sort of just a, a hesitation to admit what they should be fearful of. I don't know what the actual consequences are, but it definitely projects sort of a, a not full understanding of what's going on. What's often said that what you spend time on is what you prioritize. I don't know how long it took to shoot the selfie stick video, but I'm guessing it was more than a couple minutes. And yet uh, we can't scrape up somebody more senior than a National Security Council spokesperson to talk about a terrorist attack and not even call it a terrorist attack in Denmark. And then just a written statement on, on the murders of, of 21 Coptic Christians. It's a interesting organization of priorities, it would seem. What makes it even more bizarre to me is this administration has sort of whether you, you know, believe them or not, has sort of acknowledged its shortcomings in this realm when, when it acknowledged its optics weren't great. Uh, but it's sort of apology. It doesn't follow it up with, uh, with, with making it better. Instead, it's poking the eye you know, at the prayer breakfast, po- poking a finger in the eye of non-Muslims and then something like this. That, that it, it's just sort of bizarre in a way where it's acknowledging it, its shortcomings, its failings, but then it doesn't do anything to remedy them. For a lot of people, it seems as though no matter how low you set the bar of expectations for how this administration will respond to something this heinous, they'll find a way to shimmy underneath it. The last thing I'll say, that, you know, I touched on the, you know, some of the Democrats. Ed Henry had a report, I think it was yesterday or maybe this morning, there are a lot of uneasy Democrats. I know there's sort of this uh, unleashed Obama lame duck. You know, he's, he's not going to he's going to sort of go out in his terms. But it will be interesting to see. I mean, if members of Congress in his home party are, are, are looking at what's going on and even they can't sort of bear to sort of just write it out that they step forward and start pressuring this White House or criticizing it, at least. On to the crazy martini. And after that bad martini, it's definitely one that's needed. <laughs> a lot of people watched last night as Saturday Night Live celebrated 40 years uh, on the air, and they celebrated with a ton of former cast members coming back, former hosts, uh, celebrities who have made appearances, made another one last night. Uh, one of the original Weekend Update anchors, of course, was Jane Curtin, and uh, she shared the Weekend Update desk with Tina Fey and Amy Poehler. And here's the uh, political comment from Jane Curtin that's getting uh, some attention today. Times have changed since I first sat behind this desk. For example, I used to be the only pretty blonde woman reading the fake news. Now there's a whole network devoted to that. And there was a graphic of of the Fox News logo up there. Uh, There were a couple of references to uh, Brian Williams, so it's kind of awkward, (laughs) Andrew, that uh, the network that uh, employs Brian Williams and just suspended Brian Williams for six months would take a fake news shot at uh, Fox News. Jerry Seinfeld, in, in his uh, little monologue, uh, said you know, had a joke that Brian Williams wasn't one of the original cast members, or at least that's what he was told back in 1975. Here's uh, perhaps the most fun one for conservatives, though. This is on the red carpet. Uh, Jim Carrey with uh, a very uncomfortable Matt Lauer. Can I, can I ask you a question, you guys? Yeah, sure. Where are you hiding Brian Williams? <laughs> Where is he? No? Oh, look hey, at the time. I just, want to, I just want to say something in his, his defense, okay? If the, heli- if the helicopter in front of me gets hit, I'm taking the story. <laughs> okay? Thank you, Jim. Okay, you appreciate it. Right. Tina, thank you. <laughs> Oh, they couldn't get him off the red carpet fast enough. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> interesting night and odd that they left that joke in there. If our listeners can dig up that that video of Jim Carrey uh, uh, making Savannah Guthrie and Matt Lauer, two people that are you know potentially in the running to replace Brian Williams, <laughs> just the look <laughs> on the, they just don't even know how to handle what's going on, <laughs> which which makes it pretty funny. It's sort of funny that the lack of awareness on on behalf of NBC or the SNL writers or. You know, I guess the ancient SNL writers that came back for this reunion special <laughs> would, you know, they need to take the Fox News shot when literally someone that show is in their building, that their nightly news show is, is airs in their very building who has actually hosted SNL before. I think I was reading Brian Williams is the only network news anchor to ever host SNL, you know, is amid this this this, this controversy and they have to take their Fox News shot. <laughs> Uh, and uh, but you know I guess I guess comedy's still alive and well when people like Jerry Seinfeld and Jim Carrey and even Martin Short seem to make sort of a, a veiled Brian Williams reference. So I guess in some ways a lot of people have criticisms for SNL, but 
it was a little edgy. It was poking fun at the powers that be, even if they're in their own building last night. Yeah, one other thing that uh, political folks will probably be looking at today is that Sarah Palin, who, of course, became uh, a career builder for, for Tina Fey, made an appearance uh, last night in this kind of Q&A set with Jerry Seinfeld. And she joked about uh, the fact that she was good for the show. And so a lot of folks, including Lauren Michaels, the founder and producer of the show, uh, might want her to run again in 2016. So Palin says, I'm just curious, Jerry, how much do you think Lauren Michaels would pay me if I were to run in 2016? <laughs> Seinfeld said, run for president? Sarah, I don't think there's a number too big. To which Palin replied, OK, just hypothetically, then, what if I were to choose Donald Trump as my running mate? So uh, <laughs> on, on the one hand, it, it, it's a good line. On the other hand, uh, it kind of goes back to what folks were saying after that Iowa Freedom Summit, that uh, people like Palin and Trump keep getting a lot of time when it appears more and more likely that they have no intention of running for anything. So I guess Sarah Palin is sort of helping her own uh, her own PR and, and staying relevant while doing that on a, on a big night. But, uh, but you know, it seemed to work pretty well. And, and, and I am I am kind of surprised that she she was there. I was reading that Lauren Michaels invited anyone that's ever made a cameo, that's ever hosted, that's ever done basically anything like within the SNL studio to come back. And, uh, you know, despite being mocked and basically, like you said, making Tina Fey's career, uh, you know, I guess she was still a good enough sport to, to go and poke fun at herself. So she had fun. There's actually a funny picture of her on the red carpet at this event, which... <laughs> You know, I guess every event gets a red carpet now, but that uh, with her and Al Sharpton taking like a picture together, that's again, pretty funny if, if, uh, if listeners want to dig that up. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that one. That's uh, not one you expected heading into that event for sure. So, uh, Andrew, uh, hopefully by having a president's name, you can get some uh, free drinks or maybe even a free meal somewhere along the way today. But uh, most yeah, of all, I've never tried that. I need to try that. Most of all, I appreciate you working on President's Day and uh, filling in for Jim today. We'll talk to you later. Yeah, thanks. No problem. Andrew Johnson of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. We'll be back on Tuesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.